everyone, if we could just be seated, please, so that we could start tonight's proceedings. And welcome to the Wills Memorial Building for the Cabot Institute for the Environment's annual lecture. My name is Dale Sowerton, I'm the director of the Cabot Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today and to welcome our, our speakers. For this year's annual lecture, we have decided to focus on an issue which is pivotal to building a more sustainable future. Today, more humans live in towns and cities than in the rural areas, and this shift towards a predominantly urban world is set to continue. According to the United Nations, urban areas are expected to absorb virtually all of the future growth of the world's population. By 2050, nearly 70% of humans will live in urban areas. And by the end of the century, this could reach almost 90%. This transformation in the way we live presents both unique opportunities and complex challenges. And we therefore felt it was timely to ask the question, can we thrive as an urban species? We have invited three speakers to help answer this overarching question in their own way, building on their own research and their own expertise. First up is Sean Fox. He's a senior lecturer in global development and he's the Cabot Institute leader for our theme on city futures. And Sean is gonna explore how we became an urban species. Next up is Susan Parnell, a global challenges professor of human geography. And she's gonna examine how we can learn to live as an urban species. And to finish us off is Helen Manchester, a reader in digital inequalities and urban futures. And she will tackle the question of how we can learn to thrive as an urban species. Our speakers will each talk for 15 minutes, followed by questions and answers chaired by Andrew Kelly, who's the director of the Festival of Ideas and also the Festival of the Future City, which is an event that's been going on all week, of which this lecture is very privileged to be part of. And any introduction wouldn't be incomplete, or wouldn't be complete, without some form of housekeeping. So, there are no planned fire alarms. If the alarm goes off, please head calmly out of the doors and follow the, um, our caveteers, who are the people who welcomed you wearing the sort of blue colored t-shirts and they'll be on hand to, for any form of assistance that you need during tonight's event. And so, without further ado, I'd please like to welcome Sean Fox to the stage. For the vast majority of our history as a species, for hundreds of thousands of years, we lived as hunter-gatherers, in small bands no more than perhaps 300 strong. And now today, the majority of humans live in urban environments, hunting for jobs and foraging in supermarkets. So how did this happen and why? If we extend back that graph that was shown in the, in the introduction, we can see that there was a sustained and dramatic increase in the urban population that can be traced back roughly 150 years. And what was happening 150 years ago? Well, the Industrial Revolution was gathering pace right here in the UK. Agricultural productivity released more workers from farms, and they moved into cities that were hungry for labor to service new industries in manufacturing. This was a pattern that repeated itself in Northern Europe, Western Europe, North America, more recently, of course, in China, although on a much, much larger scale. And given this obvious relationship between industrialization and urbanization, social scientists have come to assume that these two processes are intrinsically linked. Industrialization drives urbanization. So when we ask the question, why did this happen? What drove this huge surge in the global urban population? We trace it right back here to the UK and to the birth of the Industrial Revolution. But there's a problem with this assumption about the links between urbanization and industrialization. Because that doesn't explain how a large number of countries 
have experienced explosive urban population growth in recent decades without widespread industrialization. And this is significant because it suggests that our current understanding, our current theory of urbanization is incomplete. And if we truly want to understand the driving forces behind urbanization, we have to be able to explain the cases that don't fit our traditional model. Now, much of my research has been focused on the, dynam the dynamics of urbanization in sub-Saharan Africa, which presents an interesting paradox. Now, African countries, particularly after the Second World War, as they gained independence, began to see exceptionally fast urban population growth rates. So to put it in perspective, at the height of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, the urban population of Europe was growing at perhaps 2% per year. And at that rate, a population will double in about 35 years. By contrast, in the 50s and the 60s, urban population growth rates in many African countries topped 5%, doubling in less than 15 years. But importantly, a lot of this growth persisted through periods of acute economic contraction. Not only was urbanization happening without industrialization, we have, through the 1980s and 1990s, the situation that's demonstrated on the graph, where we have a persistent and rapid increase in the urban population of the region and a decline. These countries are getting poorer and more urban. Now, how can we explain this paradox, this apparent delinking of urbanization and industrialization, and what might it tell us about the underlying forces driving the global urban transition. The first thing it tells us is that people don't just move to cities to take up jobs in factories. People move to cities for many reasons. They move to escape oppression or discrimination. Sometimes they move for adventure, or they move for love, or they move to get a better education, or they move to have more control over who they work for or where they work, what kind of work they do. Basically, people move to be near other people and to benefit from all of the opportunities that that proximity generates. And cities, as concentrations of people, represent opportunity, choice, diversity, and voluntary community. They move to cities for all of these reasons, so we shouldn't assume that they are simply responding to the prospect of a job. We thrive as social animals on interactions with others, and this is what draws us together. But if that's true, if you accept my argument that the prospect of social contact is like a gravitational force that draws people together, we're left with a very different question than the one I started with, and one that isn't often asked. Why didn't we urbanize sooner? And if we flip the question around like this, it gives us a really different perspective on this global urban transition and a unique insight. It forces us to get out of 19th century Northern Europe and investigate the histories and the experiences of cities all across the world and going stretching deep back into time. So why didn't we urbanize sooner? And the short answer is that we couldn't. We couldn't urbanize until we learned to harness energy in new and profound ways, and until we learned how to control infectious diseases. So let's take energy first. Hunter-gatherers have to live in small groups. And that's because, as a lifestyle, it's very land-intensive. It takes a lot of area, a lot of land, to feed any individual with this livelihood strategy. Even the most prosperous coastal foraging societies that we know of could manage no more than perhaps one person per kilometer squared. That's not dense enough to create a city. In fact, hunter-gatherers simply couldn't build cities with that livelihood strategy. So it was the invention of agriculture around 10,000 years ago that made cities possible for the first time. Farming is a way of extracting more energy in the form of food, calories to feed human beings from every unit of land. And it allows us to support larger and denser populations. And that's, of course, what's happened. The first identifiable cities emerged in the Fertile Crescent, maybe six or 8,000 years ago. And then, 
after this beginning of this first urban revolution in the Middle East, we saw cities emerge independently in East Asia, in South Asia, in Europe, in Africa, and in the pre-colonial Americas. And in all of these places where cities emerged, some form of extensive agriculture had emerged first. Energy availability is a physical constraint on group size in animals. And that's true for human beings as much as it is for any other animal. And farming allowed us to create more energy in a smaller space. More people could live on one little piece of the planet through this livelihood strategy. Now, over the next five to 6,000 years, more cities were born and grew, played host to many of the great characters of history, but the global urban population remained relatively small throughout this period. Perhaps no more than five to 15% of the human population lived in urban environments until about 150 years ago. And what happened? Yes, the Industrial Revolution happened in Europe, but I want to return to the issue of energy. A cascade of innovations in the 17th century stimulated our second energy revolution as a species. And it stimulated the second and now ongoing urban revolution. We learned how to harness the energy embodied in fossil fuels. Coal, oil, natural gas, these are essentially deposits of fossilized sunshine. And we use these to build our cities. And we've built thousands of new cities over the past several decades. We burn fossil fuels to make concrete. We burn fossil fuels to heat our homes, to cool our offices. We burn fossil fuels to run our cars and our trains and our buses. But importantly, fossil fuels are absolutely essential to contemporary food systems. We burn fossil fuels to build and run the machinery that we use for planting, for harvesting, for processing, and for delivering food to our plates. For every calorie that comes to our plate, many, many more calories were burned to get it there. And we use natural gas to synthesize nitrogen fertilizer. And I don't know if we appreciate just how dependent we have become on nitrogen fertilizer. It's been estimated that roughly half of the human population alive today depends upon the productivity benefits of applying nitrogen fertilizer, which is synthesized with fossil fuels. So by harnessing fossil fuels, we've been able to extract ever more food from the land and support ever more people in towns and cities. But there's another very important part of this story, and that is disease. Around the time of the Industrial Revolution, we weren't just inventing, inventing new machines and new industries. We learned for the first time how diseases work, particularly how infectious diseases work, and we began to learn how to keep them in check. And this is critical because before the Industrial Revolution, cities were extraordinarily deadly places to live. In fact, demographers and economic historians refer to pre-industrial cities as demographic sinks or killer cities because they consumed more human beings than they produced on an annual basis. More people died in cities than were born in cities in any given year. And cities everywhere depended upon a constant stream of those hopeful migrants to sustain their populations and to grow. But that began to change in the 19th century as we began to understand disease. And by the end of the Second World War, we had developed a huge toolkit for controlling urban diseases, which infectious diseases thrive in cities because they can jump Viruses and bacteria can jump from host to host quite easily when people live closely together. But now, through urban planning, through investments in water and sanitation infrastructure, simply understanding how disease is transmitted and encouraging the use of soap, these, even these simple things, had a dramatic effect on life expectancy because it dramatically reduced mortality rates, particularly infant mortality rates, which dragged down our life expectancy figures. And the benefits have been felt globally. So as this graph demonstrates, looking at life expectancy, stretching back to sort of the dawn of the Industrial Revolution to today, we've seen a dramatic improvement of life expectancy across the globe and, importantly, across very diverse African countries. And in fact, 
It's this improvement in life expectancy that helps us to explain those phenomenal rates of urban population growth that we've seen. Because for the first time, cities are able to grow from within as well as through migration. Migration is part of the story, but too often we ignore the fact that people are being born in cities and being raised in cities. And in the past, that wasn't happening fast enough for cities to grow, and now it is. So, by learning how to harness more energy and learning how to keep deadly infectious diseases in check, we've managed to smash through the ceiling of city size. Before the Industrial Revolution, there was no city in the world that reached anything like the sizes that we see today. The largest cities we know of topped out at roughly a million people. Today, there are more than 30 megacities with populations over 10 million people, some cities as large as 20 or 25 million people. That simply was not possible 300 years ago due to energy constraints and disease constraints. So, how did we become an urban species? We are social animals with a very strong impulse to congregate. And we also have the unique capacity to collectively accumulate knowledge that helps us to alleviate constraints on group size, particularly energy scarcity and disease. But before I conclude, I want to make a crucial point. Can we thrive as an urban species? I would argue in many ways we already have. Our cities are places of learning, of creativity, of innovation, and of community. But we are running our cities on fossilized sunshine. We continue to build and to run our cities on fossilized sunshine, and this isn't sustainable. We need a really radical transformation in energy systems, including our food systems, if we want to achieve a truly sustainable future. And this isn't merely a technical challenge. In fact, many of the largest obstacles to advancing sustainability today are not technical. They're social and they're political. We may have learned how to build cities, how to live and to thrive in these interdependent, complex, human-built environments, but we still have a lot to learn about how to change together. Thank you. Sean asked the question about how we became an urban species, and I want to ask the question about what does it mean to live as an urban species. And the short answer is, as long as we learn, and that is at the forefront of what we do, we have the capacity to thrive. Now, by learning I mean both that very academic, uh, institutional form of learning, and also the street learning that many of us have. Uh, in that way. Uh, but we may have to change how we learn. And the reason that we may have to change how we learn is because, as Sean indicated, we have already become an urban planet. We have moved into an urban age. And that is a profoundly different condition from that which our forefathers have and foremothers have had. Um, urbanization has been probably one of the most profoundly transforming processes, perhaps of our social condition, our gender relations, but certainly of our politics, of our economy, of our politics in a bigger kind of way. But the significance of urbanization is that it has also unleashed massive ecological change. Massive ecological change. So Sean showed you that population transition, and all you need to know and see is that upward tick, okay? And these are a whole series of metrics. One of them is as mundane as the number of McDonald's restaurants that is there. He also talked about that energy transition, and I would point you to other very significant indicators that are indicative of the changes that are taking place that mean we have to rethink. We have to relearn, we have to fill in the gaps, and we have to alter the way that we understand our lives in cities, 
our lives as custodians of an urban planet. And the one I find most interesting of this graph or the series of graphs of the urban acceleration is this one down there, uh, the, num the cement production. And when you look at that accelerating trend, remember it does not include the big cities of Africa and Asia that have still got to be built. Imagine the cement that is to come. So, we've got this huge transformation, this massive social change which has unleashed an ecological change. You're probably familiar with that statistic that says that cities take up only 3% of the Earth's physical landscape, but account for 70 or 75% of its emissions uh, and 75% of the energy that is there. So, alongside all of these transformations are these interactions between our social and our natural systems. And it is that that we have to begin to rethink. It's got to be the departure point for us to rethink. Many of us are doing that already. We are learning to live differently. Because there are so many more of us and because of the way that we live, our recalibration of our understanding about what it means to be an urban citizen sometimes involves personal learning. So for some people, it's about having one less child. For other people, it's becoming a vegetarian or a vegan, taking public transportation. And many of the people in this room will know that that kind of journey of learning is very affirming. It can be very invigorating. But the suggestion I want to make to you now is that that is a necessary, but it is by no means a sufficient form of change. We need to learn in much more radical ways. We need to unlearn, we need to reconfigure our learning in much more profound ways. And particularly, we need our institutions to begin to help us change the way we learn. And we are situated here tonight in a university. And so I want to focus some of my attention on thinking about why universities should alter the way that we learn given that we are an urban species. Remember that this is not the only place where knowledge is formed, but it is the primary purpose of an institution of higher education, to research and to train. There is an additional component to this which is very important for cities. Universities are also the places that typically legitimize and certify the professions. Many of them are involved in the built environment, the engineers, the architects, but also the lawyers and various others who run our cities. And so what we research and what we teach is of profound significance to how we navigate our lives in what we might think of as the urban Anthropocene, a condition where cities basically affect absolutely everything from the oceans uh, to the outer spheres of our life or to uh, uh, any other, uh, this dominant urban form which characterizes and pervades absolutely everything. What I'm trying to suggest to you is that without updating, without radically shifting the very nature of how we organize our universities, we will never come to terms with the kind of science that we require to shift cities in ways that are imperative at the pace and at the scale which we need to do. In other words, our institutions are not currently fit for purpose. Which is quite scary when you stop to think of it like that. I want to ask three questions about what, we, what this implies for us. Here, as we sit not just as members of the university community, but as concerned citizens interested in the knowledge agenda. The first is the question of what do we need to know as an urban species? What's different about what we need to know now? The second is the question of how can universities 
produce better knowledge that would enable us to engage the sorts of urban transitions and the way that will make our, all of our lives and our planet more sustainable. And then finally, very briefly, to begin to think about assuming we are able to do that, how do we ensure that the knowledge that is accumulated and generated amongst the academy actually engages with uh, effective implementation and policy prioritization? So, what do we need to know? Well, unsurprisingly, I am an urban geographer. I would argue that as we become a predominantly urban species, we need to know more about cities. We need to know more about more cities, especially the ones that we know very little about. But that's not sufficient. We have to find out different kinds of things from what we have traditionally known. Because if we are honest, it is also science that has brought us to the condition of an unsustainable city. Whether we're talking about the internal combi uh, combustion engine or any other aspect of science we might wish to interrogate. So we need a different kind of science as well as more research uh, on cities. And I'm happy to say that there's already been a recognition of this, and there's a reconfiguration of the way that people are undertaking urban work now. And what you will find across a number of disciplines is that instead of a fairly conventional, what we might use pejoratively, the idea of an academic tracking of patterns or um, a, a deconstruction of, of ideas about cities, increasingly what we are seeing is that scholars are turning to what we might think of as a translational approach to research. They are starting with a problem. We're using too much nitrogen. We're using, we're producing too much carbon. And they're beginning to think and work with all of the stakeholders right through a process with the intention of finding a solution and implementing it. It's called a translational approach to research. It's really quite different from what we've had before. And that's evident in, I could give you any number of examples. Let me give you one from those of you who heard last year's lecture from the climate science community, where what we're seeing is that scholars are moving to a downscaling of the models that they've been using to describe big global processes to begin to think about who will change who will intervene? Who will make the necessary uh, moves that we require to meet targets like 1.5? And part of the answer to that is local authorities, because it's cities where so much of the problem is centered. And so the downscaling of models is a very explicit engagement with who will take up, who will implement. We could argue the same thing for some of the biodiversity specialists where they're interested in green roofs, they're interested in corridors, they're interested in local species. These are all very good examples of a shift in the kind of work that is happening centered on problem solving, implementation, and the refinement of knowledge. It's absolutely true in the medical professions or in the field of urban health, maybe not even the medical professions, because in fact, not m m very little of the work that is being undertaken is actually purely biomedical. But the concern to reduce the urban burden of disease increasingly focuses on issues such as air pollution, issues such as zoonotic diseases, issues such as obesity. These are not conventional biomedical problems in the way that we have always understood them to be. So, already we have some sense of what the knowledge needs to be, and scholars are beginning to move into that space. What is true is that universities aren't particularly well equipped to deal with that problem. And there are things that they can do and can do better, and have to do better if they are to address the urban question. Probably the most important thing that universities can do in order to ensure a relevant engagement with an urban age is to allow the engagement, the interrogation, 
the research, the teaching of multiple complex problems. This is really tricky. The problem with cities is that what cities bring together, what cities agglomerate, are very complex dynamics. Let me give you some examples. I've got a political scientist sitting in the front row. And political scientists, I'm sure there are others in the back rows too, are interested in multi-scale governance, national government, local government, how different kinds of actors, the private sector, civil society, how they negotiate power. So these are complex places. People don't agree on what they should be and there are very, very strong vested interests. But those aren't the only kinds of complexities that you find in cities. Cities also bring together conflicting temporalities. What old people want from a city and its change is very different from what the next generation requires. So when it comes to thinking about what priority interventions should be, there is not just no agreement, there can be no agreement because there are conflicting incommensurate imperatives at stake. That's not just about vested interests. Some of that is technical. If you're going to be putting in place big new infrastructure, should Bristol ever get a tramway? The fiscal mechanisms that you are likely to have to invoke for a large-scale investment of that kind run over decades. The kinds of returns and the, and the way that you generate taxes are much more short-term and those things have to be mediated and brought into line. When you think about the natural resource uh, flows or the, natural, or the dynamics uh, of completing elements in a city, we don't think about things like nitrogen in the city or nitrogen flows, or you might if you're a hydrologist or a specialist in that field. But certainly we think about carbon or pathogens that circulate through the city. And when you make an intervention in one, invariably you're making an intervention in another. And the point that we know and we know well, but it didn't used to matter as much as it matters now, is that you cannot understand cities until you understand complexity. Okay? Where does complexity sit? In which department? Is, do we have a professor of complexity? We might, but I'll bet you they only look at one element of complexity. Cities, unfortunately, and also fabulously and delightfully, because that's what makes them such fantastic places to be in and to thrive in and to live in, are extremely, extremely complex. The first, that's the first thing a city can, uh, that we can do. The second thing that we absolutely have to do as scientists, not just as individual universities, is we have to change what we study. And do you know what a cartogram is? That's a cartogram up there. Um, the map. Except it's not really a map, as you can see. Because why? There's nothing there from Africa, or very little. Why? Because that's a graphic that's been presented of the research that is generated from different kinds of places. And if you have a look at that, and you remember the figures that Sean gave you about where some of that expansion in the world's population is, you will see the shocking mismatch between the relative, and I say relative, overrepresentation of research from Europe, even relative actually to the USA, and the absolutely shocking dis lack of representation or generation of knowledge about the places that face the most significant challenge and which will probably determine our collective future, those cities in Africa. And so there absolutely has to be, and I don't care what your position is on flying, we have to engage and think about the kinds of institutions that need to be built in parts of the world where this urban transition is currently underway and is yet to come. The photograph that you have at the top there, to me, is absolutely fascinating, because it's the kind of thing that I would be advocating that we should be thinking of as a community of university practitioners. The woman giving the presentation's name is Nobu. She's a town planning student from the University of Cape Town. And here, she is addressing 
the Indian Institute of Human Settlements in Bangalore. Interestingly, Bristol University, I'm happy to say, has partnerships with both of those institutions, and I think it's on that kind of basis that we too thrive. The IIHS, though, is for me just an extraordinary institution. If you assume you will have a billion urban residents living in cities of India, you're going to need, give or take, 100,000 urban professionals. I don't think we could train that number of people in all of the UK's institutions, but we certainly couldn't train them at Bristol. And so what this is, is an effort to build a new university dedicated to the question of the urban transition. Think about the old universities, which centered on questions of religion or philosophy. Perhaps the 21st century university, after all, should be one that is focused on the urban question. The third thing, it seems to me, that universities have to support is a much, much greater engagement with policy. Now, academics typically are very scared of this. We are quite anxious about what happens to our knowledge, where it will get used. Interestingly, science was at the forefront of the presentation and the generation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And it has been through a number of global policy platforms, particularly those relating to the urban question. Ironically, despite the fact that science was really centrally involved in brokering effectively a new knowledge agenda, a new political consensus that had cities at its fore, that had sustainability at its fore, and was conscious of the radical transitions that we all needed to make over the next few decades. There isn't, in fact, a global platform for urban scientists to engage with policymakers or to review and to amend and to assess our success in implementation. Much better mechanisms in things like health, led in some cases like by organizations such as the WHO. There are, however, a number of national processes where there are very direct relationships with scholars of a range, engineers, scientists, urban data analytics people, governance people, where there's a very conscious engagement. But it's not everywhere, and sadly it's not in this country. What there is much more of is a, across the world, are a set of partnerships between local universities and local authorities or cities. And I'm very happy to say um, that tonight represents such an engagement. And Bristol University is probably particularly privileged to have a city, and I mean the city there with the little C as well as the big C, the city council and the wider city community that is engaged with and concerned with the process of relearning, of thinking about what it is that we need to do differently. And so colleagues, in conclusion, when we think about the cities that are yet to come, it's a lovely phrase that Malik Simone coined, in fact, about Africa, but it applies to all of our cities. It seems to me that what we have to acknowledge is that we know we live in a predominantly urban world. That is uncontested. We certainly don't all agree on what the priorities should be or what the major interventions should be. But what it does seem to me is clear is that the knowledge regime, the teaching systems, the professional systems, the modes of our doing research are at the moment not really fit for purpose. And so we need to reconfigure our activities to make sure we're getting the right information, to make sure that universities are located and focused on those parts of the world where urbanization is most rapid and where opportunities for intervention, uh, intervention are at their greatest. And then finally, we need to be building a vibrant and a reflective and a flexible science policy interface that enables us to think, to learn, and where necessary, to relearn. All of the things that I've been talking to you about are quite institutional, okay? They're about universities. We could have been talking about cities. To do that takes extraordinary leadership. 
It also takes a whole lot of people who are ready to act on the evidence when it emerges about what it is that we have to do to learn to thrive as an urban species. And Helen, I'm going to leave you to go into that part of the problem or the opportunity. As Sue said, I've been left to the last question and, and the kind of um, call to action for everybody in the audience tonight as well. Um, so I want to start by going back to Sean's argument, really, that if we are social animals with a strong impulse to congregate and the capacity to collectively accumulate knowledge, and if our towns and cities are indeed places of learning, of creativity, and of community, and if we think about Sue's focus on the complexities of city and the need for collective learning with, within our cities and also between our cities, both locally and globally, then I think the question that I want to consider is really vital. And like Sue, I'm going to discuss three elements related to how I think we can learn to live together and thrive in times of complex change. And I want to introduce the word care in actually making a direct address to every one of you here today to think about your role and your responsibilities in caring for your cities and your communities. And I mean both now, right now, and also into the future. And I want to ask you to consider how you might act with more care in relation to others obviously including the environment, in your cities and communities. My interest in care really emerged in a research project in which I was working alongside older people, carers, and artists in care homes and extra care facilities across the city. What I noticed in these encounters in care settings was that actually the cultures of care that I saw in those settings to me seemed to not really be about the, kind, the way that I understood care to work. Um, and, I, and I wondered why this was happening. And there are many reasons for that, obviously. What I think introducing the word care to the city helps us to do is move away from our preoccupation with collecting ever more quantifiable data about experience and instead seeking to understand people's lived experiences, their existing knowledges and expertise, listening to their stories in order to consider how we might all work collaboratively together to care for our cities and communities. I'm gonna go back here now. So, I said I was interested in feminist ideas of care, and I think it's really interesting to consider how, if we start to think about care, as a feminist scholar Jean Tronto did, as everything that we do to maintain, to continue, and to repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible, and that this includes our bodies, it includes ourselves, and it includes our environment, then how does that change the way that we think about our cities? I want to say a little bit now about a feminist ideas of care which acknowledge that care is a very complex word that shouldn't be taken at face value. In fact, throughout all of our lives, we will be in need of care in some instances, and in other instances, we will be caregivers. Feminist approaches, though, suggest that care is embedded in all of our lives. It's embedded in our relationships. It's embedded in our bodies and in our loves. Care also stresses our connections and our reliance on each other rather than our differences. Importantly, though, care is also political and it can be a burden. It always involves labor and it's very often the kind of labor that is overlooked. Care is also about our bodies and our relationships to the world. It goes beyond language and can be communicated through touch and emotions. Imagine the um, holding of a hand or shared tears or laughter 
that you might engage with with a friend or family member. Care is also, though, about diligent attention to detail and attending to the messiness or the complexities of the world. As I began to think about care more, I noticed a lack of care and a lack of attention to care, actually, in so many aspects of our urban lives. And I became interested in how we could work together to build more careful cities and communities. So I promised I would introduce three essential elements related to the role of learning, creativity, and community in building careful cities. But I first want to stop for a minute and ask all of you to consider this question. What do you do to care for your city or community? And I'm going to give you a minute to actually maybe close your eyes, but have a think about that for yourself before I continue. I hope that's helped you to ground your thoughts about what you do to care for your city and community. What I want to do now is to outline three elements of learning that I feel can support us in building more careful, sustainable urban environments where we can thrive as an urban species in this time of what has been called radical change. The first element is the need to recognize existing but often invisible learning, creativity, and community in our cities and to pay attention to them. And I mean really pay attention to them. Make them more visible. Listen really carefully to what people are saying. Experience what's going on through our bodies and emotions. Even, and I would say especially importantly, if they jar with our own understandings of the world. Examples of what I mean are provided in the images behind me. Um, the one in the middle, the improvised learning that happens be between skaters and in relation to the urban environment, they share and learn new tricks in the city uh, and the urban built environment. Or here at, on the, this side, you see the creative tinkering that's happened in Sao Paulo to amalgamate stones and objects in a very Gaudi-esque kind of manner from the sea of everyday life. Uh, on the other side, a very familiar image in the city of Bristol, the learning involved as we engage in gardening on an allotment or elsewhere, understanding the kind of soil we're working with, the way the sun shines in a particular place on our allotment and not on other places, the access to water, the seasons, and what they allow us to grow or not to grow. So this kind of learning that I'm talking about, the existing learning in the city, emerges in interactions between individuals and their social, cultural, and historical environments. It also emerges in relation to the urban built environment and to the natural environment in our city. And this kind of learning, I would suggest, is also the foundation of all forms of personal and collective development. So, you were asked to have a think about your own uh, capacity and what you do yourselves to care for your city. And if you think back to that, some of you may feel that your efforts are recognized and that they're visible in the city. People know who you are, they know what you do, and they appreciate that role that you play in the city. And I know there are people here in the audience who that will definitely apply to. Others of you, may think, well, I do something, people don't recognize it, but actually I don't care because I'm not in it for recognition, and that's fine. But this idea of visibility and recognition brings me to my second element. And what I want us to think about is what kinds of learning, creativity, and community are, not rec are recognized in cities locally and globally? Which are visible and recognized, and why? But more importantly, maybe, how do histories of power and ideas about whose knowledge and expertise count play out in our institutions, in our organizations, and within and between neighborhoods in the city, 
where certain kinds of knowledge and expertise are valued over others. What kinds of inequalities do the, these ideas embed in the fabric of our cities? And how does this actually get in the way of us working together to care for our cities? What, what about the global inequalities that Sue referred to? For instance, we might think about how we might embed the experiences and expertise of those living in poverty or those who are currently homeless in our cities. Uh, and think about how this might help us to respond to um, change and the rapid change that's happening. In fact, we might ask ourselves, might these experiences and expertise be exactly the kind we might need in this time of radical and shifting change? I want to pro provide a quick example here of global movements that are already working to address some of these inequalities in visibility and participation in urban planning and decision making. So both UNICEF and the World Health Organization are uh, concerned about the voices and concerns of older and younger people that are often not taken into account in urban planning and development. And there are movements around the child-friendly city and the age-friendly city that have begun to emerge. These movements are important because they play a vital role in increasing the invisibility of the, involve, the visibility of the involvement of older and younger people. And they go some way to including their concerns in city decision making in order to challenge existing inequalities. So they are global movements that we can uh, consider allies in working towards increasing the visibility of certain kinds of knowledge and expertise in our city. And I'll come back to that example later because I also have some problems with um, those particular movements. Oh, I think that went to, yes. Okay, so, sorry, this is element three. So element three responds to the challenge of increasing inequalities in our cities and the need for collective local and global learning in response to the constant and radical change we're experiencing right now. In fact, it is that call to action that I promised at the beginning of this um, speech. So what element three does is ask all of us to consider the power we can have if we work together to build new alliances and to share resources. Here it's vital to understand we might need to build the capacity to do this. Actually, we might find this quite difficult. To work together, I think, we need to develop new relational capacities. That is to increase our understanding and expertise in working together across differences and divides in our cities. These new relational capacities, and here I come back to the idea of care that I introduced, require us to engage our bodies, our minds, and our environment in order to challenge hierarchies of knowledge, power, and expertise. I want to come back to that previous example around child and age-friendly cities and tell you a little about a project we ran here in Bristol to construct a manifesto that you can see the cover of here for an all-age-friendly city. The project responded to the increasing rhetoric of intergenerational conflict and tension in cities and communities. Rather than separating out the needs and resources of older and younger people in the city, the project worked to recognize and make visible the connections between older and younger people. This was done through facilitating creative encounters, spending time together discussing similarities and differences in order to construct a manifesto that advocated for the design of services, infrastructures, and spaces that acknowledge the need for intergenerational encounter and solidarity. Whilst paying attention to the hierarchies of knowledge, power, and expertise that have historically served to diminish the role of both older and younger people in cities, the manifesto was co-designed to recognize shared matters of concern, to build new alliances, and to develop those new relational capacities that I mentioned earlier in order to also encourage intergenerational learning spaces and those creative encounters to develop. Our intention here was really 
about engaging in a hopeful experiment. And I think that word hope is really important right now. In fact, we're doing quite a lot of work in um, our School of Education around the idea of critical hope. Um, what this helps us to do is to bring new ideas into being, I think, and to build new designs for civic learning that are with intergenerational exchange at the heart, something that is increasingly seen as what things that we can't do in our city. So, I want to finish by making some suggestions. My suggestion is, if we start from an assumption that we should embrace our diversity and work together to build on the wide range of vital and lively learning and creativity in our cities, then the processes we need to engage in to thrive in times of change would involve intentionally working to facilitate encounters with others, including those who are not like us or with whom we disagree. This would mean we were engaged in expanding our knowledge, our emotional capacities, and the resources available for all of us to deal with and make sense of new situations through sharing resources with each other, and I mean both locally and globally. In order to do this, I think we all need to commit to developing those new relational capacities that I discussed earlier in order to care for and act in and on our cities and communities together. We also do need to think about the practicalities of this, to think how we might reinvigorate the idea of care in our relationship to each other and to our urban environments. So in short, in order to create diverse, creative, fair, and sustainable cities and communities, we need to enhance the human capacity to care for each other and the planet, and to learn collectively. I think what we need to do is take action together. Thank you. On behalf of the Cap Institute for the Environment, tonight has been a really great showcase of the importance of interdisciplinary research. And it's the interdisciplinarity of the work that we do at the University of Bristol that feeds into and is captured by the Cabot Institute that is where we're going to find the solutions to the kinds of wicked societal problems that are raised by the environmental challenges that we've discussed today and have captured through a focus on the city. So without reopening some of those, those issues, I just want to say thank you again for raising, but these are complex issues that have been presented and discussed in a way that I think in, opens up a whole set of debates. And I want to thank you all for coming here and making this such a fantastic event, and I wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you.